public and private, professional regulatory and statutory bodies, and many more. Thank you all for taking the time to be here today. You're all very welcome. The large turnout is testament to the relevance and importance of the topic being discussed today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Professor Philip Dawson. Professor Dawson is the Associate Director of the Centre for Research in Assessment and Digital Learning, Cradle, at Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia. He leads Cradle's research into academic integrity and the security of online assessments. His most recent books are Defending Assessment Security in a Digital World, Rutledge 2021, and the co-edited volume Reimagining University Assessment in a Digital World, Springer 2020. The title of today's webinar is The Remote Proctored Exams Dilemma. Professor Dawson's presentation will focus on the issues and challenges of remote assessment, specifically remote proctored examinations and digital assessment, and steps that can be taken to address security and assessment integrity. The topic of remote proctored examinations and digital assessment is one that has challenged and continues to challenge us all, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has forced us all to rethink and reimagine how we assess our students in an online context. And it, it is also a constituent part of the work being undertaken by the National Academic Integrity Network. Professor Dawson, we are very much looking forward to your insights on this very important and relevant topic. Before we begin, just some, some logistics. Uh, as mentioned in the opening slide, the webinar has been recorded uh, for future circulation and distribution. Uh, we're scheduled for to run to half past 10 uh, Irish time, uh, so we'll be sticking to that time. Professor Dawson will speak for approximately 50 minutes. We'll have a short questions and answer session then at the end. But due to the, the large number of attendees here today, I would ask that participants post questions uh, and comments in, in the chat window in Teams. Uh, and I will field as many questions as I can to Professor Dawson within the time available. But don't worry, all questions and comments will be collated after the session today and we will share them with Professor Dawson for consideration. And all the commentary from today's session and the webinar recording will be shared by QQI uh, through the network. So I now hand over to our, our speaker today, uh, Professor Philip Dawson. Thank you very much, Professor Dawson. Great, thanks so much, Brendan, for the lovely warm welcome. Um, it's so great that, you know, in this era, we can do these sorts of things and I can be here in rainy Melbourne and you can be there in rainy Ireland and we, we can sort of have this wonderful connection. So I really appreciate the invitation from, from QQI and the, the network. I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago for, to my research centre in Melbourne and to a range of other people that were in compatible time zones. Uh, and gee, this presentation generated a whole heap of discussion and debate. Um, I've had people contact me afterwards uh, on both sides of this dilemma, telling me that uh, I was too far biased in the side that was opposite to them, which makes me think I probably got it somewhere in the middle. But anyway, let's let's talk. Let's talk remote proctored exams. So the, the dilemma in this is, do we use them or, or don't we? And we're going to go beyond just dilemma to sort of, if we had to use them, what would we do? So there's three things in this presentation. The first one is going to talk about the pros and cons of remote proctored exams. The second one is I'm going to try and argue to you that our decision is ultimately influenced by our sort of perspectives that we bring along with ourselves to this dilemma as much as it is by the evidence. And then finally, I'm going to talk about how to make the most of remote proctored exams from an assessment security perspective. And I'll, I'll go into what that is <clears throat> and I'll share a resource that I developed for QQI's Australian equivalent, which is called TEXA. But first, before I go there, uh, I'm just going to give a brief disclaimer. The first big piece of this is that I'm a standards-based assessment person. Um, and if you're not someone who thinks that we need to assess students, we need to have standards, uh, you know, levels of performance that we expect. We're not marking students against each other in this. We're marking students against standards. Uh, if, if you think perhaps that the, the whole notion of learning outcomes or learning objectives and, and all that 
is incompatible with your ideas of education, you might have a bad time here because I'm very much coming from the assumption that standards-based assessment is, is the way to go here. Uh, but you know, my understanding is that most regulators around the world support standards-based assessment and it's the de facto go-to or at least criterion referenced assessment is at most universities. I support assessment for learning and academic integrity. Uh, so I'm from an assessment for learning background. I research assessment for learning, feedback, those sorts of things. And I think academic integrity, the positive mission is a good thing. And I think cheating is a symptom of broader problems. So if you're coming to this and you want to say, Phil, um, cheating is all about neoliberalism or students as consumers or large class sizes or any, any of those sorts of things, I'm not going to argue against that. I'm just going to say, yes, but I have very little control over those things. So I'm not going to address those problems in this presentation, but I acknowledge them. I think universities have responsibility to try to prevent and detect cheating. Uh, that's in legislation in Australia, in some other contexts it is as well. This isn't an optional thing for us. I receive research funding from educational technology companies. Uh, the most relevant one here is Turnitin, who I believe acquired a remote proctoring vendor at some stage recently. Uh, these are my views, not theirs, but I think it's important we're transparent about you know, where our research funding comes from. And my mum helped me contract cheat in year four. Uh, I had this poster to do, I couldn't do it. Mum helped me too much. I also reckon I probably cheated in year seven when I had to write this story and my dad helped me a little bit too much there. My dad used this great word posthumous, which I you know, just kind of included. And then I was quizzed on it by my year seven English teacher and I actually didn't know what the word meant. It was incredibly embarrassing. Uh, since then, I think I've been clean. Okay, now onto the substance of the talk. When I say a remote proctored exam, what do I mean? I mean something that always has these characteristics. It's an exam, it's timed, it's on a student provided computer. Yes, I know you can do these things in a lab or something, but for our purposes today, I'm really focused on the ones where it's on the student's owned computer and at a location of the student's choosing, might be home, they might find a space somewhere else. It's monitored or recorded by a person and or a computer. So we're talking about both live human remote proctoring and AI proctoring today. And that AI is artificial intelligence. Uh, and usually when I say remote proctored exam, I mean something's got elements of lockdown and or biometrics or identity verification and usually a third party provider. Few educational institutions have developed their own in-house remote proctored tool. There are some, but it's not the norm. So that's the sort of thing I'm talking about here. Now, <clears throat> there's so many of these things. This is just one little grab from the remote proctoring SIG that you can uh, find the link there. And if you want these slides as well, I believe I've auto tweeted them on Twitter. So if you, if you go onto Twitter, you'll be able to click a link and I've, I've got the slides. I'm at Philip Dawson. Uh, and if someone's just joined and unmuted their mic, could they mute it again, please? Um, thank you. Oh, okay. All right. So anyway, if you want the slides, if someone can post up a link to the slides in the chat, that would be great. Okay. So there's tons of these things. Now, this industry, this thing is big and it is getting bigger. So it was worth about $345 million in 2019. Predictions that it'll be a $10 billion market by 2026. A compound annual growth rate of 17.4% during that period of 2021 to 2027. That's huge. Um, if it wouldn't be such a terrible conflict of interest, I would be investing in that stuff. Um, I... Yeah, I don't know. Don't take my advice as investment advice, but this stuff has really grown. Um, now, there's a quote here from one of the remote proctored exams companies uh, saying, it's insanity. I shouldn't be happy. I know a lot of people are doing so well right now, but for us, I can't even explain it. We'll probably increase our value by four to five times this year. And of course, that was in the year of 2020, where... Hey, they, they probably did. 2020 was a good year for remote proctoring vendors. 
Now, it's also an industry that's not afraid of litigation. Um, I will just read that headline by Vice, uh, an exam surveillance company is trying to silence critics with lawsuits. And then on the right, you've got <clears throat> someone who is having legal action against him by a remote proctoring company. As of the last time I checked, please don't um, fact check me or, or come and sue me, remote proctoring companies. Uh, you'll, you'll notice I try and be a little bit cagey with what I say around all of this because this is a litigious, litigious industry. Uh, but anyway, Ian Linkletter having legal action against him by a remote proctoring company, it's well worth checking out his GoFundMe. You may want to donate to that. In my view, legal action against people in this field has a chilling effect and it stops debate. So that's why I've, I've donated to support him. Anyway, it's litigious. Uh, it's also got a very polarised literature. I don't know if you saw this sort of types of scientific paper cartoon a few weeks back, but uh, I chose to do a little bit of an adaptation to types of remote proctoring paper. On reading the literature, this is sort of the gist of different papers. There's the It's Surveillance paper, lots of those. There's Students do worse when they're proctored, which means they cheat less. Uh, quite a lot of those. That's probably the most common archetype of remote proctored exams paper. There's abandoned exams and do authentic assessment instead with the idea that people can't cheat in authentic assessment. They can. That's not the topic of this talk today. But if you want to look up that sort of thing, Kath Ellis and colleagues uh, have done some great work where they found, yes, yes, you can cheat in authentic assessment. You can contract cheat it. it it's, authentic assessment's not a protection against cheating. Uh, your argument then falls to, oh, but students will want to do it if it's authentic. And yeah, we should set tasks students want to do. I agree with you on that. The next one is the proctoring is ableist, racist cop shit, which is, you know, a real sort of anti-surveillance, uh, anti-application of policing type technologies to education. There's a lot of students do worse when proctored. Oh, sorry, students don't do worse when proctored. There's a bit of that which means it's okay, which contrasts with the middle at the top. And then there's the trusting students is the solution. We should just trust them and then they won't cheat. That's the space that we're in. So a lot of conflict in this literature, kind of hard to navigate. So I'm gonna jump onto the first big chunk, which is what are the pros and cons of remote proctoring? Well, <clears throat> the pros are really, just a single pro. There is one pro to remote proctoring. And this pro is that remote proctored exams can detect or deter cheating in online exams. Uh, there's not really a number two because everything else that you might come up with, students prefer to type rather than write or they produce different text or they produce better text, which there is evidence about all of those things. Yeah, students prefer to do it at home or there's rich media affordances if we do online exams all that stuff is about online exams. That's not about the remote proctoring component. Um, if we just really cared about um, setting online exams or we didn't care about proctoring, tons of great benefits there. But we're talking about the added benefit of the proctoring today. So I'm gonna really focus in on those two things, the detecting and the deterring. To what extent is there evidence in support of that? Well, there's, a lot of studies that say students do worse in remote proctored exams versus unproctored, therefore remote proctoring reduces cheating. Uh, in addition to the they do worse, there's also they complete the exams more quickly when they're proctored. And the, the sort of assumption that's made in these studies is that this all happens because there's less cheating. There's a whole bunch of other potential explanations that usually aren't even given any consideration in these papers, uh, such as, you know, people might be more anxious in a remote proctored exam, so they finish it a lot more quickly and they do a lot worse, those sorts of things. On its own, to me, this isn't really a good argument for remote proctored exams, reduced cheating. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, there's there's the other type. There's the students don't do worse in remote proctored exams. Uh, therefore, remote proctoring is OK. Kind of, I'd love to see these people meet up with the people on the previous slide and they have their argument about how remote proctoring is OK because of these two conflicting facts. 
<clears throat> now, if I had to pick one paper in support of remote proctored exams, it would be this one. Um, there's, there's, in my view, there's not really other papers that come up to the quality of this one. So I like this study because, firstly, it's got an experimental design. A lot of the other ones are more, oh, this term we did a remote proctored exam, this term we did an unproctored one. Or for this class we did proctored and for this class we did unproctored. This is an experimental design with randomization into either a proctored condition or an unproctored condition. And yes, yeah, students did worse and took less time in the proctored condition, which was interpreted as suggesting that proctoring deters cheating. But they also talked about some rival explanations, the type of which I talked about before. But what's really cool is they used a previously validated instrument, a survey, and asked students in both conditions a range of questions, and they found the students in the proctored condition said there was significantly less opportunity to collaborate you know, unauthorised collaboration, significantly less opportunity to utilise unauthorised resources, and there was significantly more deterrence about engaging in misconduct. So for me, this one's probably the strongest piece of evidence around remote proctored exams in, in their favour at the sort of proctoring deters cheating. Now, what's missing is the peer-reviewed evidence that proctoring detects cheating. So before I was talking about preventing the behaviour, here we're talking about seeing it if it happens. There are claims, sure. So the, the claim at the top was on a proctoring company's website and is last time I checked when I copy pasted that on their LinkedIn. Using state-of-the-art technology and end-to-end -end data security, proctoring company name ensures the total learning integrity of every assessment every time. Our software eliminates human error, bias, and much of the expense associated with remote proctoring and identity verification. Now, to me, those sound like empirical claims, a lot of them that we could really validate and verify. And I'd love to do a study with them or some other proctoring company around those claims to see, do they work? Are they, are they real? The challenge is I've approached a lot of proctoring companies. I've had meetings with some of them. I've had conversations, emails, all sorts of things. I'm yet to find one that's willing to let me do a research study where I test out attempts to cheat in remote proctored exams. And I've had advice from my university's legal team that I'm not allowed to just go and do that research myself without the permission of the proctoring companies. So I can't do that sort of work. Now, there are people on the internet who just go and do that sort of work. Um, and I'll leave it to you to try and go find what they say about this because um, I don't want to be spreading rumours that may or may not be true. But one source that I, I do trust here is Riley Chase, who's a security researcher, and he's got this post about running remote proctored exams inside a virtual machine, you know, a thing that lets you like run Windows on your Mac so that you can sort of run both operating systems at once, that sort of thing. Um, and being able to cheat in the remote proctored exam through that. Now that's an old piece. That may or may not work in all remote proctored platforms. I'm not saying it works everywhere, but what I'd really love is just some sort of openness from remote proctoring companies to collaborate with us to you know, really see, does this thing stop cheating? Can it really detect cheating? And a good piece of Riley's uh, article is one of the companies did actually collaborate with him to fix the thing. I'd just love him to work with us to try and test out real attempts to cheat. Um, I've even gone as far as getting research funding that I had to give back to the research funder because I couldn't find anyone who'd let me test out the cheating. All right, that's my personal hobby horse. And if you are involved in some remote proctoring company, and you'd like to get in touch with me, please do, because I'd really love to do that sort of work. Okay. This is my summary of the evidence in support of the pros of remote proctoring. And again, this is evidence that I'm aware of. If you know any other evidence, please tell me, because I really want to have the best evidence out there. So firstly, there's evidence that remote proctoring is a way of deterring cheating. And I think there's that one really good study that I showed, and there's many low quality studies. 
they're low quality in that they don't support the inference that it uh, deters cheating. Then there's remote proctoring as a way of detecting cheating. And there we're having to juggle what the proctoring companies say versus rumours, how-tos for potential cheaters and what security researchers have found. I, I think on balance, there's a decent amount of evidence here that they are maybe a good thing, that they, you know, support deterring perhaps that, you know, maybe they might help detect. But I'd love better evidence here. Okay. Now I'm going to talk about the concerns, the cons of remote proctoring. And this is what's expressed in the literature. And I really want to stress to you, this is what's expressed in the literature. These aren't necessarily things that I believe. Uh, after I gave this talk last time, someone said to me, oh, you said all these terrible things. I'm saying them because they're there in the literature. And I'll talk with you about the evidence that I see in the literature in support of them. But I'm not saying I believe all of these things myself. We'll go through them one by one. All right. Firstly, we'll go to proctoring as surveillance or an invasion of privacy. So the privacy and surveillance angle gets a lot of airtime. And I understand it. I don't like being videoed against my will or having those videos held onto and analysed by people I don't know. So I can understand concerns about remote proctoring from a privacy or surveillance perspective. And some students share those concerns. There's a range of studies that have looked into that. There are other privacy issues beyond sort of the just kind of gut ickiness of it. There's issues around compliance with legislation. There have been arguments made that proctoring does or doesn't or is possible or is impossible to work within GDPR. Um, there's use of personal information. There's the data transfer across borders, uh, which might have different you know, uh, regimes around privacy. There's use of data forensics. You know, I might be okay about my data being on a system, but am I okay about certain algorithms running over the top of that? A lot of proctoring companies say they don't do facial recognition, and then a lot of people out there claim that they do do facial recognition. Um, it's If you think they do facial recognition and you're not okay about that, you might take issue with it. And there's the storage of data. Um, there's a more formal sort of surveillance view on it. The proctoring is surveillance using uh, David Lyon's work around surveillance culture, which is sort of surveillance that's actively participated in by people. Uh, but then also there's this alternative view. Here's a student quoted in uh, work by Neil Selwell and colleagues who says, I don't really have a lot of concerns in respect to privacy. People sitting there saying, oh, I'm not giving my information. Oh, it's just creepy. These are the same sort of students that say coronavirus is a hoax. Opposition to proctoring goes hand in hand with that. So they, to say that students are all anti-proctoring or all have privacy concerns is, is not true. There's quite a range of views among students. Okay, there's claims that proctoring creates pressure, tension, discomfort, and anxiety for students. And there's pretty limited empirical evidence on this. Uh, and it's quite an annoying thing to read the literature around this because there's a lot of chains of citations that ultimately don't lead you to any evidence specifically on remote proctored exams. I think my gut feel is, yeah, it's, it's logical to assume that there's pressure, tension, discomfort and anxiety to an extent, just as there is with face-to-face -face exams. Um, proctoring, being supervised, for, for me at least, does create those sorts of things. Um, probably one of the stronger bits of evidence is around students with high trait test anxiety. So these are people who are anxious around tests in general. They're more negatively impacted by proctoring. So the impact on grades that proctoring has was bigger for students who were anxious about tests than other students. <clears throat> There's the remote proctoring is, a so is about distrust. And this is sort of a moral or ethical argument rather than an empirical one usually. The idea that um, remote proctoring is a pedagogy of distrust or anti-cheating technology in general is about distrust that our very use of this creates a distrusting relationship between us and our students. Uh, if you're interested in this, I really like David Carlos's work. 
it predates the whole remote proctoring debate that we're having now, but it really talks about trust between us and our students, between our institutions and us, uh, trust in particular types of assessment, why we trust exams, those sorts of things. It's a great read. But yeah, this idea that remote proctoring is an act of distrust is, is pretty popular among some groups of scholars. And then there's the idea that remote proctoring is racist or ableist or discriminatory in some way. Um, there's arguments in the literature, like on the right, which is, and again, I'm reading this quote. These aren't my personal views. I had someone say I said all of those words and how could I possibly believe them? I'm, I'm reading these words. Uh, further, students must endure the racist, ableist technology peddled by companies like Proctorio, ProctorU and ExamSoft, which frames students' bodies as abnormal. Have dark skin, the racist technology cannot see you. Wear glasses, the ableist technology sees you, but it doesn't believe you are you because it can't detect your eyes. Um, <clears throat> these sorts of concerns are quite big in the literature. To me, they're echoes of sort of arguments that we're having as a society around policing and or artificial intelligence in general. Um, you'll see that one there about the bar exam in the States um, and students having to find various means to deal with not being allowed to go to the bathroom during the exam. Um, that's, you know, some kind of sad slash disgusting stuff there on the slide. Uh, this is something that's been reported about in the media a fair bit. Um, it's arguable that that might be more of a feature of the remote proctored exams design that was used. Yeah, you know, if you set someone a five hour exam, say, I don't know how long that one is, but a five hour exam and say you can't go to the bathroom, that's going to be the consequence. But that's more about the, the length of the exam and, and those sorts of things. It's possible some places do allow bathroom breaks within remote proctored exams. Okay. Next big critique of remote proctored exams is that they keep exams going and that exams are a bad thing. Now, as with the pros of of online exams versus remote proctored exams, I'm not covering that as far as the critique here, but I'll acknowledge that I'm on the record as, as saying that, you know, remote proctored exams do sort of allow us to just keep on doing what we've roughly done in the past and that that may or may not be a good thing. If we really want to reimagine our, our practices, remote proctored exams help us to, to not do that, perhaps. Or arguably, perhaps they allow us to use all the great benefits of online exams that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So a bunch of cons of remote proctored exams are expressed in the literature. These are pretty diverse things. They're pretty hard to establish empirically. Uh, and some of them are probably peculiar to particular implementations of remote proctored exams at particular places rather than inherent features of remote proctoring. Um, and, you know, we, we could use any of these, but say the bathroom break issue that I mentioned before, um, I'd say that's potentially an issue of setting a long exam and not allowing people to go to the bathroom more than an inherent thing of remote proctoring. Okay. I've gone through the pros and the cons of remote proctoring, but it's kind of hard to compare them because uh, on the one hand, we've got issues about privacy, surveillance, anxiety, distrust, discrimination, and continuation of outmoded practices. And on the other hand, we've got evidence about its effectiveness in terms of deterring cheating and claims about its effectiveness or ineffectiveness at detecting cheating. These are hard things to compare. And I'm going to put to you that I think we don't kind of do some sort of super rational comparison between the pros and the cons. A lot of us have probably decided where we sit on all of this before this presentation and before this conversation. Um, so I'd love to go through some of the perspectives that people might be bringing to this conversation, how those might be affecting things. So I've got very vaguely, and you're going to probably, if you are one of these, you might say, no, no, I belong in a different spot. I've got very broadly from perspectives at the top that might be more okay with remote proctoring down to perspectives at the bottom that would have 
a much bigger problem with it. And at the top, we've got criminology. Um, so, so criminology, if you had that sort of perspective, you might be thinking about, well, does proctoring reduce cheating? Well, perhaps through the threat of likely penalties, if those penalties are severe enough, or it might make cheating appear more difficult, or it might make cheating harder to deny. Those sorts of things might be what are going through your head if you're coming from a criminology perspective on remote proctoring. Uh, next one down, a cybersecurity perspective. And I'll flag here, I did an undergraduate degree in cybersecurity, and that might shape me a little bit here. Uh, you know, you might be thinking, does it actually stop cheating? Does it actually detect cheating? What sort of hard evidence can we get about this? Can we do penetration testing on this? Pay a professional cheater to try and cheat in a remote proctored exam, that sort of thing. The next one is assessment security. Uh, that's something that's in my book that was on that title slide. Uh, this is the idea that we want to be able to be sure about how secure our assessments are. We want some sort of empirical evidence of that. It's very similar to cybersecurity in this context. Uh, so we might think about the potential harms of proctoring against the potential benefits of it. Academic integrity tends to be a more positive mission. For an academic integrity perspective, you might think to what extent does remote proctoring develop certain values in students that we want them to have? Uh, you might think remote proctoring stops people from cheating and, and that's great. Or you might think remote proctoring creates a culture of distrust and doesn't give students the opportunity to develop their values as someone with integrity. Next, we've got sort of a philosophy or artificial intelligence ethics type view. Um, there's many ethical values and principles at play in that view. And it's about kind of balancing those against each other. Uh, you know, there's a perspective around sort of the wrongs of cheating and the need to stop cheating. But then there's also perspectives around, you know, privacy there. So the really good paper there that I, I mentioned, the Coughlin et al paper, which is a quite sophisticated philosophy of artificial intelligence view on it. There's a critical socio-technical view. Uh, you might think we need to understand the everyday realities of proctoring for students and staff, and it's sort of the lived experience. There's a surveillance studies view that, that proctoring contributes to surveillance culture, that it inducts students into a world where being surveilled is okay. If the university surveils you, then broader society surveillance of you is okay. And that might be problematic to you if you come from that view. Um, and finally, we've got a critical pedagogy view. And in this view, the harms that are done by remote proctoring are just fundamentally incompatible with education. Uh, in one of those papers, it's argued that even trying to do a sort of pros and cons analysis is a sort of false objectivity, that this is just morally not okay and we shouldn't do it. Now, if you come from some of those views, you've probably made your mind up already, but I guess I just want to really surface that as probably the key thing that we don't talk about enough in this conversation. I want to talk a little bit more about academic integrity because I think it's one of the key perspectives that we do need to surface here. Um, <clears throat> academic integrity is a positive mission. It's about fundamental values, honesty, trust, fairness, respect, responsibility and courage. And the International Centre for Academic Integrity has a great website, lots of resources on there. And they talk about those values. If you come from that view, if you think we need to develop those things in students, uh, not just because they're good for university, but because they're good for life, we know they're associated with things like fewer professional integrity problems, then you probably are asking, well, to what extent does proctoring really, really improve those capabilities in students? If you're coming from the perspective in my book, Assessment Security, well, you're after measures to harden assessment against attempts to cheat, which includes approaches to detect and evidence these attempts, as well as measures to make cheating more difficult. Now, I want to stress that in the assessment security view, this is the Suez Canal meme thing that was floating around. You, I don't know if you saw it, but 
big ship got stuck in the Suez, tidy little diggers try to dig it out. Any single approach to address cheating is as effective as that tidy digger. We need a constellation of approaches. We need something like the Swiss cheese model. Um, <clears throat> on the left, we've got the Swiss cheese respiratory virus pandemic defense model. This idea that um, yeah, masks on their own don't stop the pandemic, uh, vaccines on their own don't stop it, and social distancing on its own doesn't stop it. But a whole bunch of layers of things like that result in a, a much better chance for us to get through this thing. Um, so it's this idea that no single intervention is perfect. On the right, we've got a Swiss cheese model applied to cheating. Uh, this is Rundell, Curtis and Claire's model there. Um, I think we need to think more like this when we're talking about problems of cheating. It's easy to get kind of absolutist. Nothing's perfect. Nothing will perfectly detect or deter cheating or, or stop the problem. So let's think in this more sophisticated way of lots of layers. So remote proctoring, therefore, only has to work as a layer. It doesn't have to work as the whole system. So when I'm talking addressing cheating, I think we need to balance really those two perspectives, the academic integrity and the assessment security. We've got a sort of trusting side on academic integrity and a focus on detecting and assessment security, an educative view on academic integrity that we want to educate students so they can do the right thing, and then a punitive or pro a punitive view on assessment security that we don't want to allow people to be accredited for things they haven't done. We've got a proactive view on academic integrity and then a proactive or reactive view on assessment security. Now, it's about really a crime prevention type view and a policing or surveillance view. We're going to need a balance of these things. I don't really see remote proctoring fitting within academic integrity, but I do see it as something that fits in assessment security. So we need to be doing both of those things in our assessment, but balancing them, not viewing them as a dichotomy. We can do both, we must do both. So if we take that sort of assessment security perspective, there's gonna be some times when the pros outweigh the cons. So if you're wondering, what does Phil personally think about remote proctored exams? This is, this is the slide where I say, sometimes they're okay, but not all of the time. And later I'm gonna go into a resource where I'm gonna talk about sort of the, the times that they might be useful. So I've talked about the pros and cons, talked about the perspectives that we bring to this, and now I'm gonna talk about if we have decided that we want to use them, how could we make the most of them from an assessment security perspective? Well, there's a resource that I've <clears throat> developed for TEXA, our regulator in Australia, uh, along with input from a ton of other people. Obviously, I own any mistakes that are in it and they probably wouldn't all agree with everything in there because it's a contentious topic. Um, would love it if someone could chuck that link up in the chat so people can, can click it too. Uh, so yeah, this resource was created. It comes from the perspective of you're going to use remote proctored exams. So what are you going to do? There's 10 practice suggestions in the document. Um, I'll go through them in the remaining time that we have left. <clears throat> the first one of these is that we use remote proctored exams as a last resort. We should never jump straight to remote proctored exams. If there's some other task type that we could use instead that we think is going to have good enough assessment security, uh, it's going to suit our purposes well enough, let's do that. So this was the strongest thing that people said when I was talking with them about remote proctored exams. Uh, secondly, that the exam designs are sound assessments of learning. You heard me mention at the start assessment for learning. That's this idea that we might privilege assessments learning purpose sometimes over its credentialing purpose. We never want a remote proctor assessment for learning. We want to get rid of that. But when we're doing assessment of learning, where we're really trying to see has the person met the learning outcomes and to what extent, then remote proctoring might be valid. We want to use only the minimal restrictions required. Uh, and ideally those are what I call in the book authentic restrictions. Um, 
we want to see if someone's really doing this thing in the world, what restrictions do they do it under? And what are the, that, and that's the authentic restrictions thing, kind of like authentic assessment. Um, if we use unnecessary restrictions, we have to enforce them and they don't give us anything. So I'll give you, say, open book versus closed book. If we're assessing higher order learning outcomes and we're making it a closed book test, we have to ensure that nobody can sneak in notes or something like that. And there are ways you could probably think of that you could probably sneak in notes. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what they are, but have a think through it. Have a think about how you might be able to hide stuff in your room. Um, any restriction we set, such as it's a closed book test, makes it harder for us to enforce. So I would suggest let's think about setting fewer restrictions. Uh, fourth is that students are often an alternative. That could be, hey, you can either sit the remote proctored exam in your own home or you can come onto campus and sit it in an exam hall. Uh, I've done a lot of interviews with students lately Hi. and almost all of them, I'm so sorry, someone's got their mic on, not on mute and they're on a phone call. Um, could you please mute yourself, whoever's on a phone call? Um, yeah, I'm on, a, on a seminar, yeah. Yeah, you... All right, I'm just going to try and talk over no, the top no. of them because we're running low on time. Um, the fourth one about students being offered an alternative. Most students would choose that I've spoken to to sit their remote proctored exams. The fifth one about equity, diversity, adversity and accessibility. Uh, there's a lot in that. There's a lot of things to consider here. How are we going to make this OK for all students who might have insecure housing? who might have a disability, um, who might be going through a really difficult point of time in their life. All those things, we need to consider those. The final set of five here, firstly, provide us pilot remote proctored exams adequately before using them. Uh, sure, we've all heard a story of a provider that didn't do that during the pandemic. They just rolled out remote proctored exams to some sort of a disaster. Uh, seven, that a whole of institution approach is taken. A single lecturer can't just decide to use remote proctored exams because there's a lot going on here. There's more than any one person can do. We need the IT people, the learning and teaching people, the legal people. We need the learning designers. We need a ton of people in on this conversation. That regulatory requirements and standards around privacy and data security are met that there's effective governance, monitoring, QA, evaluation and complaints procedures. And this 10th one about student and staff capacity building, this isn't a skill set that everyone's born with to use these things. We need the support to be there and we need it to be ongoing. So if you want more about any of these, the resource that's been posted up on the chat has a lot more info on it. So just finally to conclude, there's three things I'd love you to take from this. Firstly, the pros and cons that there are some you know, decent pros, there's questionable evidence about some, there's cons. It's not so much empirical evidence in support of a lot of those, but there's sort of fundamental philosophical arguments about education and society and surveillance, et cetera. But our decision about using remote proctored exams, it ultimately is probably informed by our perspectives as much as the evidence. And finally, that there is some help out there on how to make the most of remote proctored exams from that assessment security perspective. Thank you all so much. I will stop sharing my slides and hand over for some questions. Thanks very much, Professor Dawson. Very interesting. Um, there, there's not much uh, activity just in the chat at the moment. Um, I, I just know, just to give people a, maybe a chance, just, just maybe to, to, put, to post something in just for a few moments. Um, just very interesting number of the points that, that have been made around uh, the polarised nature of the literature, that it's, it's obviously hard to navigate. It's, it's not simple. Um, industry not being afraid of litigation. Um, interesting point there as well. The whole point around uh, addressing cheating requires academic integrity, assessment security and a balanced approach that there's no one size uh, fits all. Um, certainly very interesting. Um, and, and I'm sure there will be a number of colleagues here uh, within within Ireland that would be very interested uh, in collaborating with you or sharing their thoughts with you in relation to proctoring because a, a number of, of uh, higher education institutions are have been using it over the over the la over the last uh, time. Um, 
So it, it's clear that it's, it, it's, it's very, it, it, is, it is complex. Um, and, and COVID has obviously pushed things on further um, as well. Um, just a question for me, um, do you see that as, as being positive, everything that has happened within the pandemic has been positive towards, you know, the, the promotion or the adoption of, of proctoring solutions? Well, I think we've um, we've gotten to a point that we probably were going to get to anyway several years down the track a lot more quickly. Um, yeah, we've seen both some really successful implementations of it um, that see yeah people seem largely happy with through to some great protests by students, um, a lot of sort of anti-proctoring movements being established. So I think it's it's really accelerated. Where, where we've gotten to. Um, certainly some places have used proctoring to, as I said, kind of just offer the same old exams, but some have used proctoring and the computerization of assessment to, you know, make the most of those benefits of, of online assessment. I can see a fair few questions flowing in there. Yeah, I did just one here from, um, uh, is there any direct imperial evidence from students on remote proctoring, from students particularly? Yeah, yeah. So some of those those studies I talked about where students were surveyed um, is evidence from students. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd just say that it's mixed. There's definitely a lot of work underway at the moment by various people around proctoring and students views on it. But it's, it's just it's so hard. Students are such a complex, diverse group. Sure. There was another one there from um, Do we know to what degree remote proctoring has been used in the HEAs, HEAs in Ireland? Um, we, we can park that one for the moment. Um, a lot of material to digest. The point that perspectives rather than evidence often determine choice is an important one uh, to make and goes for other uh, contested topics as well. Some commentary and some commendations just in the presentation. Uh, any comment on whether a sectorial uh, perspective might be needed or useful? That's an interesting one. And it would tie in with the work of the network with the, with the national network here at the moment. Um, yeah, I don't know so you have I'd, any views on that. I'd love to see a sector really band together and do a few things. One thing it could do, which is probably too ambitious, is develop its own proctoring thing that doesn't have some of the sort of privacy or, or whatever issues that's probably too big and ambitious but something else it could do is band together and ask the proctoring companies some tough questions um, one of those might be hey why don't you collaborate with somebody who would be willing to test out the you know effectiveness of the anti-cheating uh, but i think there's there's power in being a, a network in being a sector at being able to sort of organize and, and put some hard questions to the proctoring vendors. Sure, there's a comment there. I've, I've heard several instances of cheating in remote exams during the past year. Students coming together to sit exams. Proctoring doesn't solve all problems. Honest students don't like cheats uh, getting better marks. Yeah, I agree totally. Um, there's there's certainly stories of that sort of thing going on and if you if you google if you watch various youtube videos you can find instructions on how to cheat in those exams uh but the thing you say about honest students not liking cheats getting better marks that's a that's a big one in our interviews with students about proctoring we said yeah do you worry about other students cheating and they almost all said no i don't worry about it but if they're getting better marks than me then i'm very concerned so i think Th that's something students really do feel. Sure. Uh, does Philip have any experience of running proctoring exams and invigilated exams at the same time? An interesting one. Oh, wow. So like in an exam hall and online. I don't personally have experience of that, but I believe my institution did that uh, because we offered students the choice between a face-to-face -face or... I'm not sure. I think that sort of practice is happening as that choice that I mentioned is, is becoming a bigger thing. So I'm just looking at some other commentary there. 
Uh, in our college, we just completed a, a college-wide survey of all students and whether they prefer online proctoring exams or in-person exams going forward. 93% choose online proctored exams as their preference. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a thing. There's a vocal minority of students that are very anti them, but the students I've been speaking to generally like being in their pyjamas, at their own computer, with their own snacks, without having to travel anywhere, without having to get a park on campus, that's impossible. Uh, just another one there is there are there trends in the use cases for the adoption of online proctoring in higher education? Um, it seems that sort of business schools have really gone with this. They've had a maybe a longer history in some contexts of using them. Um, there's also a lot of adoption in places where there's professional accrediting bodies who are inflexible in their view of what's allowed. You know, it has to be a proctored exam, full stop, no negotiation. Okay. Does Philip have any experience of one or two students in a particular cohort refusing to engage with an online proctored exam? And how was this situation managed? Uh, yeah, so at our institution, students, some students did refuse to engage in it and they were allowed to, and they were offered a, an alternative. Uh, I think going forward, that's hopefully going to be the way that things happen at a lot of places because, you know, I, I can understand why some people really are just going to refuse this. So I'm I'm okay with the the refusing people. I've I've also seen cases where there's a few people refusing, really mobilising the student body, perhaps in a closed Facebook group or on the learning management system, and that can become quite a, a snowball effect. Sure. Sure. Just a comment there. Anything is better than the hack of getting to the RDS to do an exam. The RDS is in Dublin. It's a major centre in Dublin. So just a comment around that. <laughs> Uh, interesting. A comment there from IT Sligo that they've done proctored and on-site on exams at the same time. So significant experience there from some of the HEIs in relation to proctoring. There's a mention there about a well-designed open book. And yeah, I really... I really have some anxieties about remote proctored exams that are closed book because I just don't see it as a, that we can really enforce the closed book thing in an online exam. Um, so then we create this unlevel playing field where some students are cheating because why wouldn't you and all that? And then some students aren't cheating and it's just not fair. Whereas we can go open book and that's wonderful. A challenge with open book is students often don't realise how hard open book is and how well prepared they need to be. So we need to do a lot of work with students to get them to really understand what you've got to do to prepare. Sure, sure. So if anybody would like to post anything else, just we're just conscious of time here. We're, we're coming near the end now at this stage. Um, if there's any final comments, um, certainly if I've missed anything there, certainly we'll collate uh, anything uh, after the session here and we'll make it available to Professor Dawson and we'll follow up, uh, as I said earlier, um, after the, the webinar. Um, when Philip refers to offering students an alternative to the proctored exam, does he mean an alternative assessment? No, I, I mean it's still the exam, but you sit it face to face, pen and paper in an exam hall with an invigilator. Or, but I mean, that you may be able to come up with other alternatives. That's just the what the default that we've gone to. Sure. A practical question: Will the recording be shared back? Yes, it will be shared absolutely. Um, just some commentary again, thanking you, uh, Philip, for for the presentation and so on. Um, we we'll capture, as I say, all, all the comments there uh, certainly. And thanks, thank you to everybody for for their um, for the contributions there. Thank you very much. Um, again, just just conscious just conscious here of time. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for for the contributions. Um, we're coming near the end, as I say, to the session. Um, on on behalf of the National Academic Integrity ne Network, uh, Quality and Qualifications Ireland, and all the attendees here today, um, I'd like to thank Professor Professor Dawson for his very thought provoking presentation on the issues and challenges uh, of remote assessment. Uh, there's plenty of food for thought, uh, and it will certainly inform our ongoing work with the challenges associated with remote assessment, and it will most certainly be invaluable 
uh, to the work of the National Academic Integrity uh, Network. Thanks to all of those uh, in QQI and, and others who organised today's event. And thank you all for attending today that I hope you find it useful. Just a couple of reminders, um, just to take the opportunity, uh, academic integrity reminders. Uh, the National Academic Integrity Week takes place from the 18th of, from the 18th to 22nd of October 2021. And the theme for 2021 is assessment incorporating student and staff partnership in upholding academic in integrity. So a very relevant uh, theme this year. Uh, the European Network for Academic Integrity, ENAI, are holding their 2021 conference virtually from the 9th to the 11th of June 2021, and registration details can be found uh, on the website. Uh, and the ENAI will also run a summer school from June 14th to the 18th uh, 2021 also that may be of interest. Um, finally, QQI will be sending further notifications as appropriate uh, for, for upcoming webinars. So that concludes um, our webinar today, the remote proctored uh, exams dilemma. Uh, just to thank Professor Dawson and everybody again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for the kind things in the chat. It's just lovely. Thank you.